So it's not that impossible to do. All right, so as Hugo mentioned, uh, my blurb in the uh, little booklet on the website was a little bit short to be revealed. I wasn't trying to be a uh, smart ass or anything. It's just I found this issue basically a month ago, reported it to Microsoft the next day, thinking it would get fixed in a couple of days. And yeah, that's not the way things work. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is still an unpatched vulnerability. And so I'm not going to be releasing you know, copy-paste shell code that you can just take and hack machines with. So I'm going to be talking about um, shadow attacks and how this flaw impacts that and talk a little bit about how the flaw exists and where it is and how you can protect yourself as a user or as a sandbox developer. Uh, but I'm not going to release a point and click, you know, own a, own a box application. So this is shattering the Windows message passing architecture security model. I have a knack for extremely long names, so I'm just going to call it the Wimpasm from now on to not have to talk about all that. So um, I'm an instructor and contributor to Windows internals class that I give a training here at Recon, and I also do this training uh, with David Solomon Expert Seminars to Microsoft and many other corporations around the world. So primarily, most of my time today is giving uh, talks, and I'm also a student at Concordia, as I mentioned. I'm hoping to graduate this summer. I'm also co-author of the Windows internals books, so uh, fifth edition and sixth edition should be coming out soon. And everything I know about Windows, as hard as may be to believe, comes from just reverse engineering. So pretty much since I was 14 years old, I stuck my head in IDA and just disassembled the Windows kernel day after day after day after day after day. Uh, and a lot of that work went into React OS, which is an open source Windows kernel, uh, kind of like Linux is to Unix. And even after five years of spending day after day after day in a Windows kernel source code, it still can't boot from longer than five minutes. But it's getting somewhere. Um, if you want to keep up with me, Ionesco is my Twitter, and you have my email online as well as I'm easy, I'm easy to find. So this talk is going to be about shatter attacks. So shatter attacks are window message based attacks, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what window messages are and some of the boundaries around that. This is probably going to be familiar stuff, but I'm just going to reiterate it so if you come from a Linux or OS 10 background, you can have at least some idea of what I'll be talking about. Then I'll go back and give a brief history of shadow attacks because we haven't really heard about them recently because Microsoft has done a pretty good job at fixing them and getting rid of the underlying issues behind them. Then I'll be focusing on this specific, uh, a specific attack that I've built using this, this vulnerability that I'll be talking about, which basically shatters an edit box, um, and a very special edit box, an edit box inside WinLogon. And WinLogon is the logon interface to Windows. It runs with very elevated privileges. So if you can get code running inside WinLogon, you own the box, basically. Um, and I'll be talking about some interesting things about how to pull off that attack, uh, because even with this vulnerability, there's still some hurdles to, to, to go across. And of course, I'll do a little demo to you know, show you how this works. And then in the second part, we'll be talking about what actually makes this vulnerability work. Where, where is it? And we'll be talking about the, it's in the Windows subsystem. And we'll be talking about what the Windows subsystem is, what subsystems are, and also give you some tools for analyzing the Windows subsystem so you can, uh, especially if you're a sandbox developer, look into it, look into the API it provides, look into its interfaces, and protect your sandbox applications from accessing, the, accessing those interfaces. So window messages are basically 16-bit unsigned integers. They're just numbers. And the ones below 1,000 hex, which is called WM user, window message user, are owned by Microsoft. So those are their internal window messages for things like moving a window, painting a window, clicking a button. And they also have their own custom controls, like your edit box, your scroll bar, your standard suite of window graphics controls, which have their own messages as well. Everything above 1,000. That's for custom control developers, custom windows, and everybody in the world has their own window messages above that. Window messages are sent to what are called window handles. And in the Windows API world, we call those window handles H-Wins. Everybody calls them differently. I call them H-Wins. A window handle is a handle in a handle table that's maintained by the Windows graphics and window manager. And that code is in a driver that's called win32k.sys. So win32k is a driver in Windows that handles GDI, so graphics, direct text, scholar matching, printing, fonts. And it also handles what's called user. And user refers to the components that manage the window manager. So windows, buttons, scroll bars, moving the mouse, all that stuff is called user. So when I say user, in that context, I mean the window manager. And in user, there are these objects. And a window is one of these objects. 
and the data structure is called a tag wind, and a pointer to it is called a p wind or just a pond. And the type of this object is type 1. So when we're going to look at handles in the object table, with any handle that has a type 1, that's going to be a handle to a window or an H wind. There are some special hard-coded handles like the broadcast window, the top-level window, which are hard-coded to minus 1, minus 2, but those are not going to be interesting to us right now. Now, all these objects that are managed by the window manager have a special header on top, which is just called head. And some objects exist by themselves. Others are owned by threads, and others are owned by processes. So there's sometimes a relationship between an actual object owner. If an object is owned by a thread, it has, instead of just having a head, it has an extended version of a head called a thread desk head. And a thread desk head has a through object head and a desk head. Basically what that means is that it has a pointer to the thread information structure. So Win30K has its own thread structures for every graphics thread out there. And this points to that object, that structure. And it also points to a desktop. Now, if you don't know what a desktop is, I'm going to talk about it in a couple of slides. Um, that implies that these objects are owned by a thread and are associated with a desktop as well. And we'll see what desktops are. And some objects are process owned. If they're process owned, they have a proc object head. And that means that they point not to a thread information structure, but to a process information structure. All these types, by the way, they are in a symbol file. So if you have WinBag up and running on a Windows box, you can get the win30k.sys symbols and you can see these data structures. They're not, they're not undocumented anymore. The handles themselves are in a handle table and every entry in this table is called a handle entry. And the handle entry points to the head of the object, stores the owner of the object, which is going to be a pointer to the thread information or a pointer to the process information, and then stores the type of this object and some flags. Now all the types that exist, all the different kinds of handles, are actually in this array in win30k.sys called the GATI. So if you take WinBag or IDA and you uh, go to that public symbol, G-A-H-D-I, the GATI, you're going to see an array for every kind of object that win30k supports. And it's going to describe what default flags should be set for this object and who owns this object. That's how win30k.sys knows, should you create a head, should you create a through option head, or should you create a proc option head on top of these objects. So a window is owned by a thread. So it has a little flag in the GATI that says windows should be owned by threads. And the another flag specifies where these objects should be allocated. We're going to see that win30k.sys manages two heaps, what's called a session heap and what's called a desktop heap. The session heap is also called a shared heap. And windows come from the desktop heap. So they're allocated from a special heap specific to desktops. And while reverse engineering this, I found a bizarre quirk. I guess it's for compatibility. Window handles are always going to be even. And that's going to be helpful to leverage this attack a little bit later on. Now, where, where's the handle database? Well, win30k.sys, because it was originally written to be in user mode and to run on 16-bit windows, when they moved it up in the kernel, it still wanted to share a lot of data with its two clients. You may be familiar with user32.dll and gdi32.dll. These are the API libraries in user mode, and win30k.sys is the kernel component of these. So because they used to be together, they keep kind of wanting to connect with each other. So win30k.sys has a special data structure that it shares with user mode. And a lot of these data structures in the kernel actually shared and mapped in user mode as well. So the gshared info, that's the global variable in user32 and in win30k.sys, exported in both, so you can do a get proc address to get it. And inside that structure, and I'm going to dump in and win back a little bit later, there's a field called the AHE list, the AHE list. The AHE list is a pointer to the handle table. And if you're looking at the structure in the kernel, it's going to be a pointer to a kernel uh, address. If it's in user mode, it's going to be a pointer to the user address. But the actual page in RAM is the same. So this handle table is somewhere in RAM, and it's mapped equally in user mode and in kernel mode. This comes from a special shared section that win30k.sys creates whenever a new session is created. So you log into your computer as Bob or as Mary or as Alex, that creates a session. Win30k.sys creates this section uh, object, maps it in the session, and then all the processes in that session are going to have the same AHI list. So all your apps are all sharing the same handle list. So the handles are not going to be process, and they could be owned by a process, yes, but in terms of address space, you'll see them from any process. So that's a shared heap, or the session heap. The desktop heap 
which is also mapped inside every session, is stored in a special uh, object called the desktop info, or the PDI. And that desktop heap is only mapped for the processes that are, have threads in a given desktop. And again, we're going to see what desktops are. But that means that it, this is not mapped equally in all processes. Certain processes belong to certain desktops. Other processes belong to other desktops. They're going to have their own different desktop heaps. But they're going to share the shared heap. So that means that window objects only exist in a desktop heap. It means that window objects are owned by a thread and owned by a desktop. And that handles to window objects means that the handles themselves are in a shared heap, so anybody can see the handles, but the actual objects are only mapped in the desktop heap. So what's a desktop? A desktop is basically a container object that's used both for security and also for uh, management of resources. And it contains window handles, Windows hooks, menus, and input context, or IMCs. And every thread runs on a given desktop, except CSRSS, which is the Windows subsystem, and it runs on a specific, it doesn't run on a desktop. It's kind of a high-level component that has access to everything. So the desktops, therefore, they're the boundaries that protect Windows from foreign window messages. I can't send a window message to a window in another desktop because that handle won't map to any object. When the system tries to map that handle, it's going to fail because that handle points to something in the desktop heap, and my desktop heap is different from that guy's desktop heap. So Windows uses desktops to protect uh, windows from message boundaries. For example, if I go and win logon right now, and I press window key L, so if I lock my screen and I get the password prompt, what is it that I can't all tab away? Why am I stuck in this logon prompt until I put in my password? It's not because alt tab is being blocked or because some sort of security software is, is preventing me from getting to the, to back to my apps. It's because WinLogon runs on a different desktop. And on that desktop, the only visible, the only window is WinLogon. And alt tab switches you from one, from one window to another window, but there aren't any windows on the WinLogon desktop. And so the screensaver, same thing when you have a password in your screensaver in Windows. The reason you can't alt tab away is because the screensaver runs on an alternate desktop. And in fact, UAC, if you've seen a UAC prompt where it dyes the screen, make, alpha blends the screen black and forces you to press allow or deny, it's fooling you to thinking that behind that app is, is, is your desktop, just faded away. It actually runs on a different desktop as well. It actually takes a screenshot of your desktop alpha blends it black, switches to a different desktop, sets that screenshot as the wallpaper, and then displays this window. So it's actually running a completely different context. Now, there are third-party tools that actually let you use desktops as you would use them in Spaces or with KDE or GNOME on Linux. So Windows does support multiple desktops for your own purposes. There's APIs to do this, but there's no built-in uh, feature in Win GUI in Windows to let you do that. But for example, System Internals has a tool called Desktops, and with it, you can actually have virtual desktops, just like you would have on, a, on other operating systems. But internally, the OS only uses this for security. And sandbox applications use desktops as well. For example, Chrome's rendering uh, processes run on an alternate desktop. And that way, if there's malware running in there, or they've been exploited, they can't send window messages out of that desktop because the other window handles are external. So let's take a look at uh, those structures. I'm going to try switching to my Windows VM here. So we talked about this G shared info. So to get the G shared info, it's going to be in win30k.sys or in user32. I'm going to do it from the kernel just because it's uh, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so people in the back can see. Okay. And this structure is called tag shared info. Dump it. And this list here, the AHI list, that is the um, kernel mode pointer that has the handle table. And those are all the handle entries. Now, I could have done user32 shared info instead. If I, I just did a Windows update, so hopefully those symbols are still valid. 
Uh, let me attach to a process. Uh, reload user 32. I should actually, I'm getting unlucky here. Reload. Well, I'll, I'll have to switch another process. But basically, in user 32, there's the same G shared info, except this will be a user mode pointer. And what's really interesting is that Windows actually leaks the delta. So you see there's another field here called UL shared delta. In user mode, that's actually going to be the delta between this structure in user mode and the structure in kernel mode. Um, and I think that's been used by uh, certain recent uh, pool exploits where you, need, you have an exploit and you need to know what the address in kernel mode is. If it's a graphical object, it's, it's easy to do. You've got the shared delta. And the shared delta, given any Win32K.sys allocation in user mode, will tell you where it is in kernel mode. So that obviously can be useful. So what's a handle entry then? So as I mentioned, as a pointer to a head, and the head is the actual object that's being pointed here. There's an owner, which is going to be a thread or a process, the type, one for a window. The flags that specify, is this in a shared heap or in a desktop heap? Is this thread owned or process owned? And the unique, we're going to see, is what actually generates the final window handle or the final handle value that you use in a given application. So let me go back here now. Now, other than the desktop boundary, there are other boundaries as well. So Windows will also make sure that the desktop that owns the window, because remember, a window is a desktop-owned object as well, matches the other desktop. And if there's integrity levels being used, it can also check if the integrity level matches. So you can't have a high integrity, a low integrity application trying to send messages to a high integrity application. That's something that was added in, in Vista. And sandboxes also use what are called job objects. And a job object protects processes in a special sandbox. And with a special restriction you can set through the API, prevents windows in the job object from sending messages to windows outside the job object. So it's not like a desktop, but it basically is a hard-coded restriction. And Chrome also uses job objects, and so do other sandboxing applications. Again, for CSRSS threads, so for threads that CSRSS manages, which is a Windows subsystem, none of these restrictions apply. And this is why this vulnerability, which exists in CSRSS, will allow you to bypass all of these things, because you're going to have your code running inside CSRSS. So hopefully that clears a little bit about Windows and window handles. I want to talk a little bit about shadow attacks in case you forgot what they are or you don't know what they are. So they were first described, I believe, by Chris Paget. Um, and the issue here was that Win32K.sys only uses desktops as a boundary. So if you're a window running as admin and there's another window on that desktop owned by a process running as guest, they can talk to each other all they want. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a big problem, except there's certain window messages in Windows that are kind of crazy. For example, there's a window message uh, that lets you tell the other app, please run this code. So you'd have a guest app that would just send a window message to an admin app and say, please run this code. The problem was you had to get your shell code in there. Um, and how do you do that? Well, there's window messages to transfer the clipboard. There's window messages to do what's called the DDE, data exchange. So the original shadow attack used WM timer, which is a message that says, here's a timer callback function I want you to run. And it used WM paste to basically copy paste something in an edit box. So you have your shell code, and that I think it was a virus scanner application, had an admin level window with a text box inside it. He would just WM paste the shell code in the text box, figure out where the code was in the, shell, in the edit box, it wasn't too easy, and then tell it, please run this code and now this app would run your, your admin code. Now, if you didn't have an edit box, there were more clever tricks discovered, such as setting a window title to some shell code. Because a window title is part of the window object, and since window objects are shared between kernel and user, and in your desktop heap, you can parse your desktop heap, find the window title, and even know where it's going to be in the other process, and then just tell it to execute that. So these were eventually fixed, because the WM timer message should be when the system tells you to execute a timer. When you have a legitimate timer in your application, you've registered it with a legitimate API. So similar to what's done for uh, structure exception, exception handling validation, what the kernel now does with anti-user valid timer callback, it checks, is the callback associated with this message an actual callback that you legitimately created inside your own application? So now only legitimate timer callbacks will execute, not arbitrarily once. But that was only one of the shadow attacks. 
One thing that's actually not been published anywhere that I discovered while, while figuring this out is uh, I'm a big fan of looking at all these undocumented app compat and shim entries that Microsoft adds. And there actually is an undocumented application compatibility flag that says this app is broken once we apply the security fix. So for some reason, there's some apps out there that wanted to get timer callbacks for arbitrary code. Maybe they depended on that. So if you look in the threat information structure that Win32K has, there's a flag in there called no time CD protect. And if no time CD protect is set on a thread, then this protection won't actually be applied. Now, it's not a huge security issue, which is why I don't mind telling you about it, because this flag needs to be loaded from the PEB of the process, which is a special structure that exists in that process address space. So only that process can decide, I don't want timer callbacks. So you can't just pick a process and say, he doesn't want timer callbacks. The process has to say it itself. But if you go through the application compatibility shim database, there might be certain processes that Microsoft knows shouldn't get this protection. So one thing you can do is you can check for all the thread information structures with a little winback script and see if any have that flag. Or check the application compatibility database. There's a public tool from Microsoft that lets you do SQL queries against it and check you know, if you're running an app that might have this uh, set. So that's um, that little thing. Now, another shatter attack that was discovered a little bit later is called the EM set word break proc. So whenever you have an edit box, when you double click to select a word or you control shift left right to select the next word or the previous word, the edit box can actually have a custom callback that detects what the next word should be. And I think it's used for certain more complicated languages where word breaks are not necessarily spaces. But the point is, again, anybody can set what your next word break proc should be. So if you've got something that has an edit box, you can tell it, oh, when I double click you, when I select the next word, please run this code. Um, and so it's a basic same flaw as WM timer. Now, even though this was discovered and talked about, there wasn't any generic fix added to the system. There's no way to check, or at least they didn't think of any ways to check if this was a legitimate word callback or not. But this didn't become a huge problem because there was eventually a final fix done by Microsoft to all these problems. And this fix was the realization that Windows, after Windows 2000, supported what are called terminal sessions. And a session is basically an interactive or non-interactive user session with all your apps, all your content, just like when you log in remotely to a server. And the idea is, well, to have the services run in their own session as if they were you know, self-aware entities, and to have user applications and your interactive logon be on session one. So every Vista computer later has a session zero with all the services and all the system applications and a session one with your applications. And the whole point of shadow attacks was that you were trying to attack services. Well, now services are in another session. So not only are they in a different desktop, they're actually in a completely different session. So you don't have access to the session heap. You don't have access to the desktop heap. They're completely isolated. And even if the services are interactive, in the sense that they request to run on a visible desktop, they'll be running on the visible desktop of session zero, which you're not going to see in session one. So again, it completely separates and basically fixed uh, you know, the whole vulnerability. And within a desktop, they also added integrity levels. So with integrity levels now, different applications, even within the same account, can have different trusts or different uh, in integrities. And the window manager now checks if a window message coming from one application to another, or to, from one window to another, has a correct integrity level. So now I can have, let's say with UAC, a non-elevated application cannot send a window message to an elevated application, even within the same account. So it's fixed the lack of checks, and it also moved all the services away. And this is why we don't hear about shot attacks anymore. Unfortunately, with uh, CSRSS and its vulnerability, all this can be bypassed. Because if you have a way to get CSRSS to send messages on your behalf, then none of this matters anymore. So let's look at an actual practical attack. Assuming we have some vulnerability that lets us send widow messages across all these borders, how can we actually leverage that? Because there's still one security measure that works, which is the fact that services are in session zero. So because of that, even with a backdoor, we still can't send messages to services. They're in a completely different session. We can't cross that boundary. But we can now cross desktop boundaries. We can cross integrity level boundaries and cross job boundaries. So the idea is, well, what's something that's running on our session that is still very privileged? And that's when logon. When you press control delete and when logon comes up, or logon UI really, it comes up in your session, but on a different desktop. 
So if I have a backdoor, I can send it messages. Now, not OEM timer messages won't work, but EM set window break proc messages will still work. But does WinLog on have, let's do a control delete, does WinLog on have an edit box? For a while I thought not, no. And even the password prompt is an edit box, but it's a password protected edit box, and those are special, you can't talk to them. So I realized there's a nice little option called change a password. And although these are password protected boxes, the administrator edit control is not a password protected. So we're using this, if we can get messages to this guy, to this administrator or whatever edit box it is, we can now leverage this attack. But it's not gonna be that easy. So first of all, we have to figure out how to get the payload inside WinLogon. And most of the techniques are now a lot harder to exploit, and we can still perhaps use a shared heap, uh, but you need heuristics for that and it can be a little bit hit or miss. So while trying to find a way on how to send the exploit code, I realized why send exploit code at all? Because this is a local attack, and what do you usually want when you're doing a local attack, especially if it's an interactive attack? you want to have something with system privileges or with admin privileges. And usually, you know, the way you demonstrate total ownership of a machine is if you can get a command prompt with system rights. So what I really want is a command prompt with running inside WinLogon. Do I need exploit code to get command prompt? Can I figure out a way to get a command prompt without really having my own custom code in there? Well, it turns out that the next word procedure, this callback procedure, receives as the first parameter the word you've double clicked or the word you've selected. So can you see where this is going? Is there a function that lets you execute something based on a string? System, right? The CRT system function lets you spawn off any shell application. But this is gonna be Unicode string. Thankfully, Microsoft CRT is Unicode compliant and they have a W system. So you just set the window proc, the next callback procedure to be W system and now any word that gets double clicked in that edit box will be W system. So I'm just gonna type in CMD, double click on CMD, and I'm gonna get a command prompt. It's that easy. The problem is how do I actually, let's say I have the back door that lets me send window messages to this window, how do I actually get its window handle? Because all the APIs to enumerate window handles and to talk to window handles, they're still protected and they're not gonna let me get this window handle because I'm gonna, with the back door I can talk to a window handle, but I need to know what is the window handle, and I can't enumerate it. But, although the APIs won't let me enumerate it, remember that the handle table is in the shared heap, and the shared heap is valid across the whole session. So if I know what the shared heap looks like, and thanks to the symbols I do, I can enumerate every handle. Now the problem is, how do I find a window handle, and how do I know how much to enumerate? So in the G-shared info, the AHE list, that's my handle table that I can access from user mode. And in the G-shared info, there's a pointer to what's called the server info, the PSI, and in the server info, there's a C handle entries. So that tells me how much to loop for. And G-shared info in Win7 is exported, so it's easy to get. So I loop every handle entry from I equals zero to I is less than C handle entries, and I check for B type equals type window. So I only look for window handles. And because window handles are actually all multiples of two, they're all even, I can skip odd handles and that makes my loop even faster. Then I actually build the handle. Now what's the handle? The handle is basically the index in the handle table or then with that W unique field we saw, which is a random integer the user manager generates, shifted by 16. And that's gonna give me the window handle. And now I can do one more trick because this is gonna give me all the window handles. WinLogon's window handles, my window handles, everybody else's window handles. There's an API called isWindow that tells you if this is a valid window handle. And this is going to remove all the window handles that are in my desktop. If I call isWindow with WinLogon's window handle, it's gonna tell me it's not a valid window because it's not on my desktop. So by calling isWindow, it's going to remove all the window handles that I discovered that are mine. I'm gonna be left with a handful of window handles that are not on my desktop. One of those is gonna be the edit control. The others are probably gonna be the other passwords and a button. So I still don't know which one exactly of those, uh, but at least I've been, you know, shrunk it to five or six. Now, G-shared info is Win7 exported only. There are two other ways to get it. There's an undocumented user register while handlers API in user32, 
If you call this API, it copies a bunch of data structures or callbacks, and then the very last thing it returns you G shared info. So you can leverage this to get G shared info. Unfortunately, this API will only work if you're a WoW 16 or VDM application. So you have to register yourself as a DOS app. So you can either patch this code, because it's, it's going to be inside your own uh, address space, or you can see my recon 2006 talk about how to become a DOS VDM application, and then the API will work. The other thing you can do is you can connect to CSRSS. We're going to talk about CSRSS and WinServe after. If you connect to CSRSS's uh, WinServer, it's going to tell you what the G-shared info is. So there's lots of ways to get it. So here's a very simple sample of how we can detect all the window handles that are not inside our current desktop. So the idea is WinLogon is running, and now on the main desktop now, I run this code. So I get the shared info. I loop the AHI list, index plus equals two to skip uh, the odd ones. I check if it's a window. I build a window handle. I call this window. And that's going to print off all the windows that are not in the current desktop. Now, which one of those do I actually go ahead and exploit? Well, as a quick hack, just because this is an interactive attack, we're going to have the user tell us which window handle to use. So how is that going to happen? Well, we're simply going to have the user input X number of characters in the edit box, so seven characters. Because once I have a list of, let's say, five or six candidate window handles, I can send them a message with a backdoor called WM get text length. And this is going to tell me which of those window handles have seven characters in them. When you go through the change user control, you're going to have a username and three empty edit boxes. So on the one that's not empty, where I'm going to put in seven random characters, the exploit is going to detect, aha, this must be the edit box. So it's not a perfect thing. There's more advanced ways of doing this. But this way, at least, is a simple way for the user to tag which one. So this is the final code. For every window that we found that's not on the current desktop, check the text length, and I pick seven. So I put in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or anything that has seven characters inside of it. And uh, then I send a bang, just to say, hey, I found you. And then I set the word break procedure to the shell code. And what's the shell code? W system, the CRT function. Thankfully, WinLogon is a C++ application. It does have the Microsoft CRT runtime. The address is static. So as soon as I double click that word now, it's going to spawn off whatever I put in. So let's see if that actually works, or hopefully it's just not theory. So this is my uh, admin session. So I'm actually going to log off and do this from a, from a non-admin session. Hopefully the demo gods will be nice today. Uh, and WinHack is basically the compiled app. Remember, to run this exploit, we actually need to be in the WinLogon interface. So what this exploit does is basically waits for 10 seconds, giving me the time to press Control Delete click on change password, go to the admin prompt, and put in any seven character key. So let's hope this works. That's seven characters. <laughs> See if we get a bang. There's the bang. That means the exploit is installed. CMD, double click. And now you own the system. So obviously, it does require you to have launched some executable as a non-admin account. So you do need local privileges, a guest account or something. And that's a little script that found the window handles, found the one that had seven characters, and sent it that little bank. So it's not a remote. You can't just go to a WinLogon prompt and put NSA key on anybody's computer. It's not going to work. <laughs> you need this running, OK? Marks, I wanted me to be very clear on that. Just don't walk up to a computer and put NSA key. <laughs> OK, so how does this work? What are we leveraging for this back door? This back door has to do with the Windows NT subsystem design. 
The NT subsystem design in Windows NT requires a little bit of history. When Microsoft first worked on NT, their original goal was actually to design Windows NT for OS2, which was an operating system IBM was working on. And the original name, by the way, NT, comes from the N10, which was this RISC processor, the Intel i860, that Intel was working on. So it was going to be Windows OS2 for the N10. Now, Intel CPU didn't really work out, so they changed N10 to new technology. And they dropped off the OS2. And instead of calling it Windows NT OS2 1.0, it shipped as Windows NT3 to match Windows 3.1. So they decided to make Windows NT for Windows apps and to ship for x86, MILF, uh, MIPS, Alpha, and PowerPC. Now, because of contractual reasons, they couldn't just tell IBM, yeah, never mind. So they had to keep supporting OS2 apps. So Windows NT had to run Windows apps and OS2 applications. And when they went to the government to sell Windows, the government wanted POSIX compliance as part of their government licensing program. So Windows NT had to run POSIX apps, OS2 apps, and Windows apps. So they had to run three different kinds of applications on their system. So I like to call Windows NT an OS with multiple identity disorder. It doesn't know what it is. So how did they do that? Well, they created this native NT environment, the actual core language and the actual core behavior of Windows, and it's very, of NT. And it's very different from Windows. For example, drive letters, forget about those. NT does not understand drive letters. Internally, NT uses partition devices, like slash device slash hardest volume one. If you're Linux or Mac or anything user, that should sound familiar to you. That's the same thing that Windows NT uses. There's this little, this little subsystem, this little emulation wrapper that makes drive letters work in NT. And NT doesn't use ANSI letters or ASCII characters. So any, unique, only any ANSI text that's sent to the kernel becomes Unicode text. And in fact, interestingly enough, NT doesn't use null terminated strings. So you never send strings to null character, or I mean you do, but NT doesn't depend on a null character. It builds its own special structure called the counted Unicode string. So NT always knows how many bytes there are going to be in that buffer, and that's what it trusts. And that can actually create some pretty interesting issues. Uh, for example, through NT, you can create a file called hello null world. And then in the Windows API, if you browse that directory, you're just going to see hello, because the Windows API uses null characters. If you try to delete hello, which is going to tell the kernel, please delete hello, the kernel is going to say, there's no file called hello. So a lot of malware actually uses this, this discontinuity between NT and Windows. And it's also case sensitive. So in fact, through the NT API, you can create a file called foo, all caps, foo, lower caps, foo, capital O, lowercase o, and NT understands these are three different files. And that's because in Unix, which Windows has to support, these are three different files. In my Windows internals training a couple days ago, actually somebody was surprised to learn, see that Windows NT supports forking. And yes, you can fork with Windows NT because Unix apps have to be able to fork. It's not exposed to the Windows API, but the kernel does support it. So all those APIs, like the .NET APIs, the Create File APIs, the Kernel 32 APIs, Common Control APIs, they don't exist in NT. They're part of the Windows subsystem. Uh, console I.O., so standard in, standard out, standard error, printf, NT doesn't support that. And graphics, NT doesn't know anything about that. So this whole stuff about window handles and messages, it's outside of the kernel's purview. And NT also has some other interesting behaviors. For example, if you tell NT to shut down the machine, it's just going to kill everything. So there has to be something else that shuts down the applications correctly, gives you APIs, gives you consoles, gives you windows. And that's what the Windows subsystem is. Now, all images you build for Windows in the PE file header have a subsystem type. And usually when you build your own applications, that subsystem type is going to be Windows GUI or Windows GUI. But you can also build POSIX apps, OS2 apps. Uh, Xbox also has a subsystem type. EFI applications have a subsystem type. And Windows used to ship with subsystems for OS2, POSIX, and Windows. Now, they got rid of uh, OS2 after Windows XP came, when Windows XP came out because the contract with IBM had expired. And POSIX eventually got sold to another company that made it so good that Microsoft bought it back and introduced it for free in Server 2003 or 2. In fact, in this done later, if you have ultimate professional or, or business, if you go to your control panel and add remove programs, there's a little option that lets you install the Unix subsystem, which is now called a subsystem for Unix applications. So in the registry, you've actually got a key with all the register subsystems. And there's this application called SMSS, the subsystem and session manager. It goes to that registry key and loads all the register subsystems. So theoretically, you could create your own one if you knew how. 
So when the Win32 subsystem has three components. Most subsystems have three components. A runtime process. The runtime process sits in user mode and manages all the applications belonging to the subsystem. And this is called CSRSS. Then the subsystem has libraries. These are the actual DLLs that provide the APIs. So kernel32, user32, gdi32.net, advapi, common control, MSI, all the DLLs on Windows are almost Windows subsystem DLLs. And it also has a driver, which is win32k.sys. So the window manager is part of the Windows subsystem. That's what's called Win32K, the kernel version of Win32. And it provides user, which is the window manager, and GDI, which is the graphics engine. And the POSIX subsystem, which is now called Subsystem for Unix Applications, has the same. It has a process called PSXSS. has a subsystem DLL called PSXDLL, where you're going to find your fork, your open, your close, etc., And has a driver called PSXDRV. And OS2 used to have OS2SS, OS2DLL, et cetera. So when SMSS looks over the registry key, it looks at required subsystems and optional subsystems. Required subsystems are started when you boot up the machine, and optional subsystems are started when the first app of that subsystem uh, is launched. And then it uses ALPC, which is the local procedure call uh, implementation in Vista and later. It's an IPC mechanism that Windows internally uses. And it creates a special port. This is very similar to mock ports called SMAPI port. And there's an API to talk to SMSS, RTL, send message to SN. And that's what CSRSS uses to start programs across sessions, to load subsystems. This port is protected. Only system apps can talk to it. So there's no risk about uh, there's, nobody can talk to this port other than CSRSS. So that one is protected. So let's look specifically at CSRSS, which is the client Windows subsystem runtime. It was originally called this way because there was not supposed to be a subsystem model in Windows. There was supposed to be CSRSS, which supported OS2 apps, and that was it. So that's why it has this client server runtime name. Even though it's a client of SMSS, it actually is its own server. And it hosts five different server DLLs. So all the functionality that CSRSS provides is split across different DLLs. The first DLL, DLL0, is called the core, CSRSRV.DLL. And this is what actually implements CSRSS. If you reverse engineer CSRSS, you're going to find five lines of assembly code and a four kilobyte binary, which just loads CSRSRV. So CSRSRV is the CSRSS server itself. It's what implements the functionality. The base server is what kernel32, or in Win7, kernel base talk to. The console server is in WinServe, and it provides the console APIs. In Win7, they move this in what's called conhost. So part of CSRSS now lives in what's called conhost. It was done for integrity level protection for consoles. You can read about that. The third server is called the user server, and this is the one that talks to the user portion of Win32k.sys. That's also in WinServe. And there's also SXS, or side-by-side. -side. This is a side-by-side -side server that handles the Fusion Manifest cache and all that side-by-side stuff, side -side stuff Microsoft built for .NET and the, to prevent DLL help. And if you look at the server DLL command line argument in CSRSS, so if you go to your registry, uh, we can go navigate the, oh wait, I'm in a test account. Uh, I could run the exploit. But no. <laughs> Let's just do it a nice way. Uh, if you go in that key that had this, the, sub, the SMSS slide, you'll see that CSRSS gets on its command line which server DLLs should be uh, loaded. And I thought it would be interesting if we could add our own server DLLs in here. Fortunately, so let's bring up system, current control set, control, session manager, uh, subsystems. So there's this huge command line here. Put that in Notepad. I know you can't see it very well, but uh, we'll may make it bigger then. And this huge command line has all the server DLL names and their initialization. So I thought, oh, cool, you can extend CSRSS and put a new server DLL here. Unfortunately, it has a hard coded array of only four entries. So if you add another one, you're going to corrupt CSRSS's stack. So don't do that. Of course, you have to be admin to go here, so it's, it's not a flaw or anything. So these DLLs get loaded. Now, what do they, how do you communicate with them? Well, CSRSS creates an ALPC port. And this port is called the API port, and it lives in the Windows directory. 
So if you go through, not the Windows directory on your disk, but the Windows directory in your object manager namespace. So in the internal namespace of objects, there's a slash Windows slash API port. In fact, there's one CSR says for session. So in session one, there's a slash session slash one slash Windows slash API port. For session two, the same. For session three, the same. And this API port, anybody can talk to it, even the most unprivileged to the most privileged process, because this is the key port through which code inside your application talks to CSRSS. So even an unprivileged application has to talk to CSRSS. And the hope is that CSRSS, when it gets messages, validates what are you trying to tell me and who are you. And of course, the issue is here that for one of these things, it doesn't do that. So CSRSS messages are defined as CSR API MSGs. So that's the actual data structure. It has a connection info and it has a capture buffer. So you can actually do marshalling over CSRSS parameters. And every API has what's called a CSR API number. So there's a list of APIs. Now these structures get overloaded by the specific server. So the base server implements base API messages. The console server implements console API messages. The user server implements user API messages. Now what does the base API support? Process and thread creation. So whenever a new process or thread gets created, CSRSS gets a message and it has its own data structures and it'll actually dump them. These are useful for rootkit detection and things like that because CSRSS keeps its own internal information about Windows apps and threads. Uh, DOS support, the uh, internationalization cache, side-by-side -side stubs, DOS device letters, ENI to registry mappings. Did you know that if you open up win.ini and you edit the desktop in the win.ini file, just like you would in Win 3.1, CSRSS sees that you've done this change, goes into registry, checks which registry key maps your ENI file, and sets the correct registry key for you. So Windows 3.1 apps can still work. That's app compat for you. Console APIs have the console I.O., DOS console handles, aliases, command history, screen buffer, fonts, menus, keyboard layouts, everything, all the console APIs in Windows, from read console to ally console to write console, they all do LPC calls to the console server. In fact, if you enumerate your entire directory with dir slash, uh, dir c slash s, or you do something in a console that there's a lot, a lot of output, you're always gonna see CPU usage from the command prompt and CPU usage from conhost or before Win7 CSRSRV. CSRSS. So CSRSS is always busy handling console I.O. or con hosting Win7. And the user API server implements uh, shutdown. So if you were to tell the kernel to shut down, it would shut down. Your apps, they expect to get a nice little message that tells them, would you like to shut down? Is it okay for me to shut down? Let me wait for you to shut down. The kernel doesn't do that. So actually, when you call the shutdown API, you, you tell CSRSS to shut down, and the Windows server then notifies everybody and waits around. And once the Windows server is satisfied that all your Windows apps have gone away, then it tells the kernel to shut down. Uh, also, that fancy new UI in Vista that dims the screen and shows you which apps are not shutting down, that's also managed by WinServe. Uh, device notification events, end task. So when you try to end task and you get a little dialog, that comes from CSRSS as well. The actual mouse and input code is in the WinServe. So if you actually try to kill CSRSS or suspend it or do something to it, your mouse and your keyboard is going to stop working. Because Windows apps don't talk to the keyboard driver directly, they talk to CSRSS, and CSRSS talks to the keyboard driver. So if CSRSS is not there to do that, your apps don't get any mouse or keyboard input. And also logon notifications are handled there as well for, again, caching and internationalization. So how would you talk to CSRSS if you wanted to write some code to talk to it? First, you define the actual API message structure you want. So if you want to send it a base message, you define a base API message. Then, if you want to have any strings or any parameters that you want to marshal, you create a capture header. You call CSR allocate capture buffer, and this creates you the buffer. Then if you want messages to be allocated inside that buffer, you call CSR allocate message pointer or CSR capture message buffer. So you get these nice little APIs for marshaling strings across your app to CSRSS. Then you pick which API you want based on the API's number, and there's a nice little macro called CSR make API number. You give it the index of the server you want to talk to, one, two, three, four, based on base user con, and the actual API number for that server. And then you send the whole thing with CSR client call server. CSR client call server takes the API number, takes the capture buffer, and takes the, IP, the API message, and sends it across the CSRSS. And when you're done, you call CSR free capture buffer. 
So in the NDK, which is a development kit that I publish on Google Code, the native development kit, it's also in React OS, you can search for it, all these functions are there. So all the CSR API functions, the macro to make a CSR number, and the actual server indexes that you need. The other stuff though, like the actual definitions of the API messages and the API numbers, those are not documented, but quick Google searches will reveal all sorts of websites that this information has somehow appeared on. So this is a simple pseudocode of how you talk to CSRSS. This is based on ReactOS uh, code that defines a DOS device. So when you call define DOS device in the Windows API, it builds a define DOS device CSR message and sends it to uh, CSRSS. Then CSRSS, based on the server index, will figure out which of these servers should get the message. So it's really easy to, to communicate with it. Now, one thing I want to show you is you can actually uh, look at what are some of these CSRSS um, functionalities and also dump some of these structures. So if you actually attach a CSRSS with WinBag, you get two special commands. Now, never attach invasively because that'll free CSRSS and then your mouse and keyboard are going to stop working. And never attach the CSRSS in your own session, even non-invasively. So I'm going to connect the CSRSS in session zero just to show you these, uh, these two little commands. Of course, if you have a remote machine or a VM, you know, you can do it remotely that way. So, run as admin. So, attach, process, non-invasive, and this should be the one for session zero. So you get a nice little bang DP command. And bank DP is actually going to dump you all the processes uh, inside, all the process structures inside CSRSS. And this is a cool way to find hidden processes, actually, because most malware doesn't know how to mess with these structures. Uh, and then the bank DT gives you information on threads. So you pick one of these processes, and you can dump what's inside there. Let me just, again, make the font bigger. So you can pick one of these processes and do a bang DP on it, uh, and then use the V flag. Oops, the V has to be before. And when you do DPV, that dumps you the structure inside CSRSS. So you can see every process that CSRSS knows about, the handle, and also the LPC port that this process is using. That's a handle that connects this CSRSS with this process. Which process is it? Well, you can use the process ID to figure that out. Uh, there's also a process. So the process ID is stored in client ID. So if you dump that, you're going to get the PID. Then for every thread and every Windows process, CSRSS stores a CSR thread structure. So you can also dump the CSR thread structures. One thing that's interesting with uh, bang DT, and one thing that's interesting in the CSR thread is that CSRSS also caches the creation time. So the creation time is stored in the kernel. It's stored in user mode. Um, for forensics, there might be applications that want to hide their creation time. CSRSS also saves it, so that's an extra little piece of information. And of course, CSRSS also has a handle open to every thread. Another interesting tidbit about CSRSS, these guys at the German University got these massive servers with lots of memory, and they were told that the Windows kernel could support up to 60 million threads. So they went ahead and they tried to create 60 million threads. After 4 million threads, it started taking 5 seconds per thread. Because whenever you create a new thread, CSRSS gets a message. And CSRSS looks in that list entry, which is a double link list, for do I already know about this thread ID? Well, what happens when you have 5 million threads in a double link list and you have to enumerate it every time? It takes 5 seconds per thread. So it has some interesting performance uh, issues. So with uh, this command called DPS, we can actually dump the different API tables. So once, inside, once we're inside CSRSS, we can see what are all the server-side callbacks that are going to get called. So I'll just do one of these. I'll do base serve. So DPS base serve bang base server API dispatch table. And judging by the name of the function that handles it, you can kind of guess what API 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are. So create process, create thread, exit process. And you can reverse engineer these or figure out what the data structures are. Or again, if you search on the internet hard enough, you, you'll find them because some of these have, have leaked. So these are some useful links. 
Uh, Drew's blog has some nice little information on CSRSS uh, marshalling. Uh, on the Woodman forums, there was, again, somebody posted some definitions of CSRSS. And when Googling for some of these structures, there's a couple of other websites that, you know, I'm not vouching for them or anything, but certain definitions in there might be useful. So finally, to wrap up, how do you, what do you do now to protect yourself? Because I haven't mentioned, I'm not gonna mention which of those APIs is broken, but I will mention enough that will let you protect yourself either as a user or as a sandbox developer. So first of all, this backdoor API that lets you send a window message to any window in the current session will bypass job limits, will bypass desktop boundaries, will bypass desktop boundaries, will bypass IL boundaries, but will not bypass session boundaries. So the session isolation still is in full effect which means that if you're a user, you don't have to be necessarily that concerned because your services are still in session zero and services are usually what you want to exploit. Now, I exploited WinLogon, but you saw there was a lot of interactivity required. I had to switch the WinLogon prompt. I had to um, you know, put a little seven character key in there. I had to write CMD, I had to double click. So it's a very interactive exploit. I'm not saying it, could, it couldn't be made non-interactive, but the way I designed it was to be interactive um, and so it's not like somebody who can easily replicate this. If you're a sandbox developer, the things you need to look at are realize that even the most unprivileged application can talk to CSRSS. As soon as kernel 32 loads, it opens an ALPC handle to CSRSS, and then any code can call CSR client server and use this. So evaluate if the code you're protecting should be calling CSR client server. If you're just rendering HTML data or rendering PDF data, this might not be needed. But if you're gonna create new threads from your sandbox process, then yes, you do need to let CSRSS messages go through because CSRSS needs to know about the new threads your sandbox app is creating. So if you don't need it, block it, or look at closing the handle. If you can close the handle, then an attacker would have to create a new handle to CSRSS, and now the uh, SIDs and the tokens would be in effect. So for example, Chrome clears out the token, so after the handle is closed, it couldn't be reopened. If you do need CSRSS APIs for your app to work, trace which API numbers are normally being sent. Because the one thing I can say is that this vulnerability uses an API number that nobody normally uses. So you should never see this API number. So look at what API numbers your app normally uses, put a breakpoint on that and see what APIs you usually see, and do a whitelist. You know, of course, do some app compat testing, but don't allow any API numbers that you don't normally see your application do. You know, tested heavily, obviously, and until it patches out from Microsoft, that'll at least make sure that this one really won't work. Even if somebody figures out what it is, that API number, your whitelist won't allow. So any questions?